am Trudy Murata. I am a volunteer community ambassador with AARP here in Northern Virginia. And from our earliest beginnings, AARP has championed lifelong learning. That's why AARP is thrilled to be collaborating with the Lifetime Learning Institute of Northern Virginia to bring our members a sampling of the rich programs offered by them each semester. For more than 60 years, AARP has been a wise friend and a fierce defender, helping individuals to ensure that their money, health, and happiness live as long as they do. AARP has earned a reputation as a wise friend and fierce defender through trusted information, tools, and advocacy designed to protect the health and financial security of older Americans and empower them to choose how they live as they age. As this wise friend, AARP helps you to protect yourself and your loved ones from fraud through our Fraud Watch Network program, get healthy and stay healthy, care for loved ones, make connections, plan a trip, learn new technologies, attend a class like this class that we are being shared by the Lifetime Learning Institute of Northern Virginia. So I hope you'll continue to take advantage of these opportunities and more. And now it's my pleasure to turn the program over to the folks at the Lifetime Learning Institute of Northern Virginia. And Patty, would you tell our AARP members a little bit about the organization? Thank you very much, Trudy, and welcome to everybody. This is, uh, we've been doing this now for two or three years and uh, we are a very small, independent Lifetime Learning Institute. Uh, we are affiliated with actually a community college, the Northern Virginia Community College, the largest community college in Virginia with uh, campuses in uh, uh, probably up to about a nine or 10 uh, counties at this point in time. Um, for a modest fee of $125, uh, we give access uh, to our members to three semesters of classes uh, each year, uh, and each semester comprises between 30 and 50 classes. Uh, we have about a dozen special interest groups, which run the gamut from uh, mystery books to foodies to photography, um, a vast, uh, a vast uh, um, variety of uh, special interest groups that anybody can join. Uh, we also have a variety of committees. Uh, one of us, one of them is the excursions committee, and we have daily uh, trips in a variety of places in and around the district, of Maryland and Virginia. So these are day trips, uh, not to be confused with another committee, which is our study travel committee, and that encompasses trips that are a week to two weeks long and can be anywhere in the world. We've been to the Rhine, we've been to Ireland, we're going to Australia uh, in uh, January and February. Uh, we also have nine forums uh, every year, a variety of Zoom or in-person forums. And these are of general interest uh, to the general public. They, they are also open to non-members. Uh, we have had the ACLU and uh, a couple of librarians come to talk to us about uh, the entire banning books issue. We have had a variety of authors come and talk to us about what inspires them, keeps them going. Uh, we had an interview with the conductor of the Fairfax Symphony, uh, which was actually quite fascinating. So the forums are really of, of uh, general interest and open to everyone. Um, realizing that the vast majority of you are not located in the DMV, I'll close with, with a uh, solicitation to you. And that is we are always looking for instructors. Uh, our instruct we have a variety of Zoom classes. And so we can draw from people all over the world for that matter, um, but certainly within the United States. So if you are a frustrated teacher uh, or a frustrated instructor and want to share your knowledge with us, please go to our website, which will be posted in the chat room, uh, and we would love to hear from you. And with that, um, I guess, uh, Debbie, shall I turn it over to Dan? 
No, me first. Okay, you first. Briefly. Hi, I'm Debbie Cohn. I'm an LLI board member. And I'd like to introduce Dan Sherman, retired Cornell economics professor. And he has presented um, many talks to many lifelong learning groups in the area and beyond. And today's talk marks his return to LLI NOVA after his popular July presentation on Oppenheimer. Dan is scheduled to return to us and AARP on October 29th with Alfred Hitchcock, Man of Suspense. Please, as we said, please put your questions in the chat box and Dan will address as many as possible at the end of the program. Dan, take it away. All right, well, thank you uh, AARP, thank you um, LLI. I'm a card carrying um, AARP member and I live within a mile of a community college here. Um, yeah, I'm very happy to be here. I've given this Hamilton talk, I have to admit, like 200 times, even though my background's in economics. No one wants to hear about economics. I tend to talk about uh, music, musical theater. Hamilton, though, makes a nice bridge to that because, as you uh, know, learn if you don't already know, Hamilton is absolutely instrumental in American um, economic history. We had a question here. What are we talking about today? Well, we're going to talk about a man called Alexander Hamilton, a real life individual, and a musical based on his life, which if you haven't heard of it, I'll ask, where have you been? Very popular uh, musical, astoundingly popular actually, and uh, associated with this gentleman who played Alexander Hamilton on stage, uh, Lin-Manuel Mar uh, Miranda here. Making history of Hamilton, as I said, I've given this talk to um, a lot of different groups. And one group I gave it to, um, I was part of a lunch program. I had about half an hour to speak, a little less. And here it's an hour and a half. I'll try to stay within that a little less um, there too. Gilda needs to be admitted to the waiting room here. But uh, the theme of the talk that I gave or the theme of the event was making history. And I'll just admit Gilda. Um, and I'd like to say this theme of making history is absolutely essential, I think, to Hamilton understanding why the musical is so popular part of what makes it so very special here. So we have the character, not the character, we have the individual Alexander Hamilton um, here, certainly made history, a very, very important individual. We learned about him in our history books. We may not have learned everything about him because we didn't read the book by this gentleman, Ron Cherno, who is a journalist, not a historian per se, but he writes books about historical figures. And he started out working in the world of finance. He wrote a book about J.P. Morgan, the Warburgs, John D. Rockefeller. And then he started working on a book on George Washington. The George Washington book actually came out after Hamilton, because as he was working on George Washington, he kept coming across Alexander Hamilton and just realized how important he was and thought and how interesting he was. And he thought he would write a necessary biography. So he writes a biography of Hamilton, 2005. George Washington comes out at 2010. I recommend both books. They're both about 800 pages. Uh, the Washington book in particular is interesting because I think you, you think you know George Washington, but you'll learn a lot from reading this book. Subsequent to writing the Washington book, uh, Chano did a book on Ulysses S. Grant, and now he has a book coming out. It's either March or May of next year on Mark Twain, who edited uh, Grant's uh, memoirs. But Chano made history by taking the facts of Alexander Hamilton's life, turning them into a very um, readable, very popular biography. Seen here, uh, Ron Chano, Alexander Hamilton, with the link to the show um, here. And how did um, Hamilton, this 800-page biography, become a show? Because this young man, Lynn Manuel, uh, Manuel, uh, Manuel, Manuel uh, Miranda, read this 800-page book and thought it would be the stuff of a musical. Seems unlikely, but uh, we'll explain how that happened here. And I think what Hamilton is about at its core, part of what appealed to Lynn um, so much was the fact that Alexander Hamilton came from what we would now call a disadvantaged background, really came to this country with nothing um, and made something about himself. And really the central message of Hamilton is you need to have a legacy. You need to have history. You need to do something with your life. And I think Hamilton, Lynn, Lynn manuel Miranda saw that and I think that comes across in the musical. People see the musical 
And it's kind of, wow, this guy did a lot. We can identify with these founding characters. And maybe we should make something of our lives of all ages. And Hamilton appeals to the very young. Um, kids love it, kids under 10. Um, I've been told we'll sing Hamilton at their birthdays. That's what they want. They read this 800 page biography. They know every single line in the uh, musical um, as they go along. And hopefully everybody here uh, will love Hamilton. So Hamilton is about making history. So who was he before the musical? Here, well, here's a statue of Alexander Hamilton and kind of what I learned back in high school. I'm not a history major uh, per se, but he was the man on the $10 bill. He's first secretary of the treasury, hence we see his statue at the treasury. He was one of the author of the Federalist Papers, those uh, papers written after the Constitution uh, was written, but before it was adopted, arguing for its um, adoption. Hamilton was one of the three authors. He wrote most. He wrote more than 50 of the 80 papers here. Rather famously, he was shot by the sitting vice president, Aaron Burr. I certainly remember that. Well, what do we know now? He, we know much more about him as an individual, partly from the Cherno book, but he was an ambitious character for sure. He was um, an immigrant. He was an outsider. He was not like George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, didn't come from a well-established family that had been in the colonies for 50 or 100 years with a lot of land. Um, rather, um, he was he lost his mother when he was 12, never knew his father, had a stepfather uh, who left. And his mother died when he was relatively young. He was living on a Caribbean island. Um, English colony, and he made his way up to Boston and then New York. Circumstances of his birth, his mother had improperly divorced, so he would be called a bastard. John Adams called him a Creole bastard, a political enemy um, of his. So absolutely brilliant, hardworking. Um, I say hardworking because he, for everything he did in his 40-some years, um, he did a lot of writing, a lot of pamphlets, a lot of letters. His the collected works of Alexander Hamilton, twenty nine thick volumes. You don't you wonder how he found the time. Yeah, my my collected work is probably about half an inch thick, but very very much involved in politics and policy in the early part of the United States, the first term of George Washington, and really before. But he had his ideas of what the United States, this new country, should be, and he had a lot of disagreements. It was you know rather open about what the country should be, open questions. And Hamilton is, sorry, I'm trying to stop uh, some of this, was absolutely in the thick of things. Um, and he got into a lot of disagreements with the other founders, particularly Thomas Jefferson um, here. Hamilton is responsible, you can blame him. Um, I'm not sure why Gilda this keeps entering the waiting room, if we can admit her, please. Um, she was re Hamilton is responsible for the um, District of Columbia being the nation's capital. We can blame him the swampy land here. He had a very significant role in the American Revolution. I did not appreciate that. He's in his early 20s, and this is a good time to remember. When we're talking Alexander Hamilton, we're talking someone who came here um, in the 1770s during the Revolutionary War, the early part of it, who was in his teens and 20s, and then he goes on to become Secretary of Treasury. He's in his 30s. He's a relatively young man. He's going to have basically 10 years um, in the wilderness um, here. He's going to die in his high 40s here. Uh, this gilder is bothering me, but anyway. He's involved, I didn't learn this in high school, a well-publicized sex scandal um, here. He's involved in several duels and near duels. You know, uh, duels typically didn't happen. Two people would challenge each other and hopefully everything would get resolved. Well, one challenge Hamilton got involved with, of course, he did go to a duel, it ended his life, but he got in a duel with a man named James Monroe or the threat of a duel. And when you have a duel, you'll hope that it won't actually happen, that they'll, uh, your seconds will resolve the issue um, that you have. And it turned out James Monroe's second resolved the issue, the James Monroe Hamilton didn't duel. Who was that second, that individual? A man named Aaron Burr. Uh, Hamilton's own son is going to be killed in a duel a couple of years before he is four years. Same place, same set of pistols. Kind of an amazing story, isn't it? And even though he's 49, he may be 47, we're not quite sure about his birth certificate. He was a has-been, but he goes on. He's never truly forgotten, but 
Um, I think it's in recent years, we really appreciate everything he did, his importance. Um, how interesting the story. So how did we get to this Broadway musical? Well, we got there a little bit indirectly because Lin-Manuel Miranda, uh, Manuel Miranda, young man, he had done a show called On the Heights, set up in uh, Spanish Harlem. His family, his family is from Puerto Rico, though he was born and raised in the United States here. And uh, they set this musical. It's been made into a movie. Very, very successful at one best show, et cetera. Lin-Manuel Miranda is after this, it takes a vacation. So he goes down to Mexico as he's passing through the airport. What does he do? Uh, picks up this thick biography of Alexander Hamilton, from a Borders bookstore, if you remember them. And he reads it, he loves it. And he's thinking he might write some songs about Alexander Hamilton, not a musical, not something for the stage, but rather like, Le Miz, a Jesus Christ Superstar. You may remember Jesus Christ Superstar, a big brown album. Before it became a show, was a set of songs. So he was going to write a set of songs about Alexander Hamilton without the idea of taking him to stage. But we'll see, he wrote one song, people loved it. And almost six years later, it made it to stage. So, so Hamilton... The first time anybody really heard, uh, you know, he was working on Hamilton, he had this idea, but he was invited to the White House 2009, President um, Obama had just been inaugurated, and he had an evening uh, spoken word, it was called, spoken word and poetry, and Lynn was invited there with his uh, music director, and they thought, well, maybe he would do some songs from um, In the Heights. Instead, he surprises everybody, he, music director, starts playing unfamiliar music, it's a song about Alexander Hamilton. And it's a bad choice of words, but the um, the tape of that went viral. Everybody loved Alexander Hamilton and said, uh, where's the musical or where's the album? So he started working on the album. Then he started doing workshop performances where people would sing the songs, selected songs and weren't that many. And then eventually it would go to Broadway, off Broadway and then Broadway. So, um, it made it um, 2015, short off Broadway, then Broadway, hugely successful. It won absolutely every award you could, including the Pulitzer. Uh, Lynn won a Genius Award, MacArthur Grant, et cetera. And it began to tour in 2016. And then Disney um, filmed a performance with Lynn manuel playing um, Hamilton and others and was going to show it in the theaters in 2021. But with COVID in 2020, they decided to put it on the Disney Channel. Um, you're probably aware it was impossible to get a ticket. You know, it was hundreds and hundreds of dollars to get a ticket. The scalpers were busy. I was able to see it shortly after it came out. I have, I'm happy to say this, but I had the experience in August, they started selling tickets. I knew I was going to be in New York a few months later. I went to the Hamilton, to the theater website, and I saw the tickets going boom, 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 just disappearing in front of me. So happy to have seen it. Disney, though, filmed a performance. It's actually different to see it on screen than to actually see it in the theater. Both good experiences. Um, if you haven't seen it, you know, you, a lot of people signed up for Disney, myself included, um, to see it there. And I'd recommend watch it with the captions on to really capture the words to it. So Lin-Manuel Miranda, here he is at the White House. This comes from a uh, an event I attended. Um, at the National Archives in 2016. They did a little documentary on the making of Hamilton, and then they did um, interviews with Hamilton and Ron Chernow and others. I actually saw, got to very briefly meet Lynn, uh, but I ended up chatting with uh, Ron Chernow for 20 minutes. It was a fascinating individual, very nice guy, um, too. So I like this because you get to hear uh, the beginning of Hamilton. And this is what is going to become the first number in the show. Hamilton is, um, he's not singing per se. It's going to be other characters singing about his life, but it is Alexander Hamilton's background. We'll learn more about Hamilton very quickly in the show. But here you'll um, hear Lynn, you'll see Lynn, uh, Ron Cherno, the author of the book, and you'll get a little background on the making of the show. Oh my God. How does a bastard orphan son of a whore and a Scotsman dropped 
in the middle of a forgotten spot in the Caribbean by Providence, impoverished and squalor. Grow up to be a hero and a scholar. The ten dollar founding father without a father got a lot farther by working a lot harder, by being a lot smarter, by being a self starter. By 14, they had placed him in charge of the trade and charter. And every day, while slaves were being slaughtered or carted away across the waves, our Hamilton kept his guard up inside. He was longing for something to be a part of the brother was ready to beg, steal, borrow, or barter. Then a hurricane came, devastation reigned, and our man saw his future drip, dripping down the drain. Put a pencil to his temple, connected it to his brain, and he wrote his first refrain, a testament to his pain. Well, the word got around, they said, this kid is insane, man. Took up a collection just to send him to the mainland. Get your education, don't forget from whence you came, and the world is going to know your name. What's your name, man? Alexander Hamilton. His name is Alexander Hamilton. And there's a million things he hasn't done. But just you wait, just you wait. This is the first year when we're honoring three honorees, and it's so perfect, so appropriate to bring Hamilton to the stage with Lynn Manuel Miranda, Tommy Kale, and Ron Chernow. It is a great triumvirate. I'm past patiently waiting, I'm passionately smashing every expectation. One of the things I find most exciting about this award this year is celebrating. Ron Chernow's work in using the records of the United States to tell the story of Alexander Hamilton. In addition to Ron making an accessible text, we've got two creative geniuses who have brought their talents to tell the story in a manner that has never been used before, which has so captured the public in a new way. It's a unique celebration of American history. We'll never be the same, Alexander. Yeah, I'm the damn genius that shot him. My point of entry with Hamilton was his uh, power with words. When I first met Lynn back in 2008, one of the first things that he said to me was that Hamilton's life was a classic hip-hop drama. And of course, I had no idea what he was talking about. He's a fighter, but he's also a writer. Um, this is a guy who wrote an essay about a hurricane that destroys St. Croix, and that's the thing that gets him off the island. And that's a hip-hop character to me. That's what my favorite hip-hop artists do. They write about their circumstances, they write about their world, and if they write about it well enough, they transcend it. So I love that bit of Ron Chernow saying, um, you know, um, Lynn said, Hamilton, Alexander Hamilton was a hip hop character. I have no idea what he meant. Well, somebody who rises above his circumstances. So now we're going to get the opening of the show, what you would see if um, that opening song as it would be sung in the show. And the way it's sung in the song, you don't really hear Alexander Hamilton. He's coming onto the stage and it's going to be the various characters, George Washington, others who knew him, who are going to comment on him. And when you go to the end of the show, when everything is wrapped up, you get the same sort of setup uh, that people come and they reflect on Alexander Hamilton. So now you're going to hear, if you will, Alexander Hamilton coming to New York City and people commenting and they're going to explain, among other things, that you'll get the sense, ambitious character, but forgotten. How does a bastard, orphan, son of a whore and a Scotsman, dropped in the middle of a forgotten spot in the Caribbean by providence, impoverished and squalor, grow up to be a hero and a scholar? The ten dollar founding father without a father got a lot farther by working a lot harder by being a lot smarter by being a self starter by 14. They placed him in charge of a trading charter 
And every day while slaves were being slaughtered and carted away Across the waves he struggled and kept his guard up Inside he was longing for something to be a part of The brother was ready to beg, steal, borrow, or barter Then a hurricane came Devastation rained on man He saw his future drip, dripping down the train Put a pencil to his temple, connected it to his brain And he wrote his first refrain, a testament to his pain Well the word got around, they said this kid is insane man Took up a collection just to send him to the mainland Get your education, don't forget from whence you came And the world's gonna know your name What's your name man? Alexander Hamilton my name is Alexander Hamilton And there's a million things I haven't done But just you wait, just you wait When he was ten, his father split full of it Dead, ridden two years later See Alex and his mother bedridden, half dead Sitting in their own sick, the scent thick And Alex got better, but his mother wiped Moved in with a cousin, the cousin committed suicide Left him with nothing but ruined pride Something new inside a voice saying Alex, you gotta fend for yourself He started retreating and reading every treatise on the shelf but There would've been nothing left to do for someone less astute He would've been dead and destitute without a cent or restitution Started working, working for his late mother's landlord Trading sugar cane and rum and all the things he can't afford to scare the number a little bit of Hamilton himself but mostly people speaking about him George Washington Madison Jefferson Aaron Burr who is going to be the counter to Hamilton um, Eliza and other Eliza his wife um, will be there too but I urge you you know I'd love being able to show the words here you'll see just how good the rhyming is um, here and I was a little surprised when I went to hear it I'm more of an opera fan I didn't think I was going to enjoy it I loved it. I could hear every word clearly. Just it's written very well with the music. Though when you watch, you know, it's nice to see it on TV with the uh, captions, just to make sure you capture the words. Or um, if you have the CDs, you'll um, get the words follow along. So some things on that opening, just great number. It's four minutes. I say five minutes here. It's really uh, four minutes of um, music here. This is Hamilton. It's his background story, his coming getting into New York, what happens next from there, coming up from the Caribbean after a hurricane um, here. Well, Ron Cherno would say, and he would be right, of course, he knows this. It's about 40 pages of his book. It really has a lot of detail on Hamilton, very much distilling the story of Hamilton's life. The Hamilton book, 800 pages. Hamilton had a very eventful life. You read through the book, listen to the musical. It's about 500 pages of the book. There's part of Hamilton's life that aren't really covered, more of the latter part of it. But it's surprising how close it is to Hamilton. Ron Chernow is going to be involved with um, 
Lin-Manuel Miranda as he writes it. And you will hear lines in Hamilton. You'll say, what, what does that mean? And then you'll go to the Hamilton biography and you'll see it's capturing some part of it here. Um, it's a long musical, or what I should say, it's about two and a half hours, but it's a wordy musical. It has about 20,000 words. Your typical musical probably has five, 7,000 words here. You have the dialogue, and then you have the show, uh, the songs. But because Hamilton is telling 500 pages of story, um, it almost gets written in a way that you have to have a form of song that you can have a lot of words go by fairly quickly. And it's not all rap music, as they say. It's not all this like rather fast talking through the songs. So there's certainly some of those um, just to mix it up. And it needs to be mixed up. You'll get some very beautiful, slow songs. I'll play a little bit of them. And I think part of the beauty of Hamilton is or the appeal of it is it really does have a nice mix of music. But um, we get to see Hamilton. He's this outsider. He's a fighter. He's almost forgotten but he wants to have a legacy, that idea of making history here. And not your typical show music. This is, if you will, very contemporary music that younger audiences would know. It's not your Rodgers and Hammerstein. In the 1950s, uh, up to that time, you know, Cole Porter would write the latest hit that you'd hear the singers singing, you'd hear on the radio back in the 30s, 40s, 50s. Well, that disappeared in a way. Broadway musicals, by and large, were not a source of popular music. They sounded differently. Hamilton and other shows help bring them together um, too. So we've met this character, Alexander Hamilton, but we don't know much about him. Uh, we know his background, but what does he want? And uh, most musicals have an I want song. You know, you think My Fair Lady, all, um, Eliza, All I Want is a Room Somewhere. Well, here's Hamilton. What is he going to do? And there's a song called My Shot. And here, you know, he's coming with no background. He's landed um, in the United States and you're going to get a song. It's ironic. He says, I'm not going to lose my shot, his opportunity. Of course, at the end of the musical, he's in a duel. Question is, when you're dueling somebody, you've got a loaded pistol. In this case, do you hold it up into the air, shoot it in the air, lose your shot, or do you use it? What do you do? So you've got that, you know that's coming. But this comes from a clip. Um, remember, Lynn um, comes from, has a Puerto Rican background. And Hurricane Maria has come through Puerto Rico. This is after the show. He's finished up in the show. It's still playing, but he's no longer playing Hamilton. And he went down to uh, Puerto Rico to help with the relief efforts. They did some benefit shows there. And to go back there, he had to learn the lines again. And he said, it's tough, you know, uh, even for he who wrote uh, the song. So he's on a British TV show. He had done, um, and this is important for a little later, he had done Mary Poppins Returns. He had a relatively small part. Uh, Emily Blunt, uh, the English actress, had played Mary Poppins. And then you had uh, um, the two other characters, husband and wife. And they're on the show with Graham Norton. And he's talking about going back to Hamilton, learning it. And you'll see him. He's not going to sing the song but he's going to talk it through. And you're going to get a sense of the rhyme, the difficulty, the richness of the language, but also the difficulty um, of it too. And it's just, I think, brilliant rhyming, brilliant poetry. Again, uh, when you hear it in the musical, it's going to be music, not the sort I'm familiar with, but it works. Somebody needs to mute. Hamilton's first big song in the show is called My Shot, and it is the biggest sort of meal in terms of lyrics. And if you can get through that, you've got the show. You can, it's sort of like the way Hamlet's like six major monologues. It's like, if you can get my shot, you, you've got it. Can I poke you with a stick and you can do a little tiny bit? I, uh, I could try. Oh, go, yeah. go. I have to stand. Can I oh, stand? Stand, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I won't remember if I'm sitting. OK, stand, stand, stand. A scholarship to King's College. I probably shouldn't brag, but dag, I amaze and astonish. The problem is I got a lot of brains but no polish. I got a holler just to be heard with every word. I drop knowledge. I'm a diamond in the rough. I shine a piece of coal trying to reach my goal. My power of speech unimpeachable. Only 19, but my mind is older. These New York City streets get cold. I shoulder every burden, every disadvantage. I've learned to manage. I don't have a gun to brandish. I walk these streets famished. The plan is to fan this spark into a flame. But damn, it's getting dark, so let me spell out the name. I am the A-L-E-X-A-N-D-E-R. We are meant to be a colony that runs independently. Meanwhile, Britain keeps on us endlessly. <laughs> Essentially, they tax 
attacks us relentlessly. Then King George turns around and runs a spending spree, and he ain't ever going to set his descendants free. So there will be a revolution in this century. And to me, he says in parentheses, don't be shocked when your history book mentions me. I will lay down my life if it sets us free. Eventually, you'll see my ascendancy, and I am not throwing away my shot. Yeah. It's something like that. Oh. Wow. Welcome to Try That at Home. Um, it's a hard one here. So we get the show, the first act. It's got um, two acts. It's a very straightforward story. Hamilton and the country, Hamil the Hamilton and the duel, everything in between. And then the book ends, Hamilton being introduced and, if you will, the apotheosis of Hamilton wrapping up. So we get first act, his early years. He's going to meet his wife, Eliza. We will have the Revolutionary War and after um, the Constitution will be briefly mentioned, the writing of the Constitution, he'll be at the convention, and then you'll see him as George Washington's uh, Secretary of Treasury. The second act, um, it's going to be politics. These two words go together, I guess, politics and his decline um, and leading to the duel. Aaron Burr is going to be there. There's prob this is probably played up more than it actually was in real life, but the two were in the same place at the same time. I gave this talk to an inner city school and somebody, the drama club, and somebody said, is Aaron Burr the Greek chorus? And I said, absolutely. You know, he's commenting on Hamilton um, throughout um, here. So something at the counter Hamilton here. And it's it's conventional. People say it's revolutionary, but it really is a straightforward story. A lot of big numbers. And there's a lot of story. There's a lot of narrative in there. Some would say there's almost too much story and Lynn Emanuel Miranda said he could have written about Hamilton coming off the islands, Hamilton and war, Hamilton and love, Hamilton and government, if that would be interesting, Hamilton and the duel. So a lot is covered in two and a half hours. Roughly 43 songs, it's sung through, really no dialogue um, other than a line or two here. Well, what's nice about Hamilton is very often when you write these historical um plays, dramas, uh, musicals, and I'm thinking of 1776 in particular, you don't have a lot of roles for women. You can think of the musical 1776. You have um, a role made for Abigail Adams and um, Martha Washington, but not much more. But here, the women have a really important role. And what's nice about Hamilton, the musical, is even though Lin-Manuel uh, wrote it himself and played Hamilton, the other roles are great. Aaron Burr, I think, is an even better role. There's a small role for King George III. It steals the show. It's a great one. You have other characters. And then the women have um, good roles. And there's several women here, three women. And you'll. Uh, what's nice about this, these are three sisters, the Schuyler sisters, the uh, daughters of a well-to-do individual. Hamilton would marry Rich. He will marry Eliza. But there'll be an older sister named Angelica, who he'll be in love with. And the musical kind of hints that the two are having an affair. They certainly got along very, very well. But the reality is when they, when he meets the woman who will be his wife, Eliza, she is married and she spends most of her time in England during what would have been the time of the affair. There is a third sister, uh, Margaret, who goes by the name Peggy. It's almost a joke. She doesn't really have much of a presence other than in one song to sing, I'm Peggy. These clothes are be beautiful. Hamilton had great costumes. And if you look at portraits of these sisters, uh, the best known portraits had them wearing dresses in these colors. So we'll get to hear um, these three sisters. There's a lot of emotion in Hamilton of people falling in love, having children, having an unfaithful spouse, losing a child, losing a husband. Um, and these women carry this emotion here. So we have Hamilton in love with the two sisters. And you just get um, a great song here. Um, it's the beginning of the American Revolution. We're in New York City, the big city. We're down by Columbia College, King's College, which at that point means Lower Manhattan. And yeah, these women are out. Everybody is interested in them. They're having a night on the town here. There's a line, maybe it's not politically correct, but um, it's Aaron Burr will sing, excuse me, miss, I know it's not funny, but your perfume smells like your daddy's got money. The lines in Hamilton are great. Well rhymed here. And let's get a little bit of the song. And what's fun about this, you'll see these intelligent women and one of them will say, you know, Declaration of Independence is great, but hey, when I meet Thomas Jefferson, I want women in the sequel, that all men are created equal. 
and rich folks love more than going downtown and slumming it with the poor. They pull up in their carriages and gawk at the students in the common just to watch them talk. Take Philip Schuyler, the man is loaded. Uh-oh, but little does he know that his daughter's Peggy, Angelica Eliza, stay in the city just to watch all the guys. It work, work. Angelica, work, work. Eliza, and Peggy, work, work. the Skyler sisters. Angelica, Peggy, Eliza, work. Daddy said to be home by sundown. Daddy doesn't need to know. Daddy said not to go downtown. Like I said, you're free to go. But look around, look around. The revolution's happening in New York. New York. Work. It's bad enough that he wants to go to war. People shouting in the square. It's bad enough there'll be violence on our shore. No ideas in the air. Look around, look around. I'm looking for a minded work, work. I'm looking for a minded work, work. I'm looking for a minded work. work. Like summer in the city, someone in a rush, next to someone looking pretty. Excuse me, miss, I know it's not funny, but your perfume smells like your daddy's got money. While you slumming in the city in your fancy heels, you searching for an urchin who can give you ideals. Sir, you disgust me. Ah, so you disgust me. I'm a trust fund, baby, you can trust me. I've been reading Common Sense by Thomas Paine. So men say that I'm intense or I'm insane. You want a revolution, I want a revelation. So listen to my declaration. We hold these truths to be self evident. All men are created equal And when I meet Thomas Jefferson uh. I'ma compel him to include women in the sequel Work! Look around, look around at How lucky we are to be alive right now Look around, look around at How lucky we are to be alive so, I hate to cut all these songs, but I will Hamilton and war Well, remember, New York City is the largest city in the United States It's where the British come in They bring in more soldiers than there are citizens in the um, city and what's beautiful about Hamilton is because so many kids, and by that, I mean, you know, those under 18, uh, loved Hamilton. Teachers loved Hamilton, too, history teachers. They could say, okay, you know that line from Hamilton, you know that song, what's actually going on? Tell us about the American Revolution. They could use it as a nice springboard here. So Hamilton, um, Alexander Hamilton, he's, we're well, not quite how old he is, um, yeah, just some questions. Let's say he's 18. Um, the musical fudges it is slightly here. But the United States, it's a pretty dire time here. Uh, George Washington, the army is a continental army. At one point is down to 5,000. The British have 10,000 troops, tens of thousands of troops, 30, 40,000. And it's really the task of the United States or what will become the United States, the Americans, is not so much to... Um, win, but to not lose, to wear the British down. And that's ultimately what happens here. So the British, there's a set of battles in New York City, the Battle of Brooklyn and others. Uh, George Washington is going to have to you know, take the troops out of New York City, abandon it. And again, you get a lot of history here. Here's George Washington. Every character in Hamilton has a distinct musical style uh, here. George Washington, he sings very straightforward, almost like hymn singing uh, here. So perhaps appropriate. We'll see him as um, head of the army, first act, president, the second act here. So turns out George Washington has a good eye for talent. He sees Alexander Hamilton. And even though Hamilton is 20, 22 years old, he makes Hamilton essentially his right-hand man. He's got a military family. Hamilton is involved. Hamilton has this really fine sense of business. Even though he left the islands when he was in his teens, when he had died, he had gotten a job at a trading house. He learned business, international business, um, tariffs, essentially, um, exchange rates, um, inventory. And that helps him in the American Revolution, essentially begging for credit, trying to buy supplies for the army, negotiate contracts and the such. That knowledge is going to help him when he becomes Secretary of Treasury um, also. Uh, here, but he's also a very, very good writer. George Washington is not. The two are very, very close in uh, temperament, attitudes, and um, Hamilton is going to do a lot of writing for George Washington, both during the war. He will be a secretary. He will write letters to Congress, etc. But when uh, Washington becomes president, Hamilton is going to be 
writing some of George Washington's letters, speeches, which were mostly written at that point, including the famous farewell address. Um, so here's Hamilton. He very much wanted to get away from the desk. And he does get a chance to go down to the Battle of Yorktown with his friend, the, Lafayette, the Marquis de Lafayette, uh, who likes him. So here's an imagined portrait of George Washington and Hamilton. You go down to the Yorktown battlefield, you'll see an earthen fort at the very, you know, basically when the Americans won, Americans and French, the French, of course, helped the United States out tremendously during the war. When they move in on Cornwallis, um, Hamilton, leads a charge at one of the forts uh, here, and you can still uh, see the fort. It's a great battle actually here. So um, here's Hamilton, another imagined picture. We're going to see here a little bit of the Battle of Yorktown. This could be the end of act one, it's not, but you'll see how Hamilton the musical tells the story. And the name of the song, World Turned Upside Down, because that's the song the British sang as they were leaving Yorktown, laying down their arms not to this music, which is original, but in some sense, the world was turned upside down for them. So. After a week of fighting, a young man in a red coat stands on a parapet. We lower our guns as he frantically waves their white handkerchief. And just like that, it's over. We tend to our wounded. We count our dead. Black and white soldiers wonder alike if this really means freedom. Not yet we negotiate the terms of surrender i see george washington smile we escort their men out of your town they stagger home single file tens of thousands of people flood the streets there are screams and church bells ringing and as our fallen foes retreat i hear the drinking song they're singing Hamilton, you know, uh, the war, it isn't over. It's going to take a couple of years, actually, for the treaties to get signed and all. But uh, the war is essentially over with Yorktown. Hamilton has had a son. And we have to wrap up, though. Um, so we have a few songs to go uh, for Act One here. And we have three songs essentially getting us to Hamilton becoming Secretary of Treasury. First thing, we get just a delightful song, a British breakup song. As I said, every character in Hamilton has their own voice, own style. And one person I haven't mentioned, King George III shows up as the British rather foppish king. It's a great role. And what does he sing? The breakup song, oh, you're my girl. You know these songs from the 60s, you're my girl, you left me, you'll come back, you'll realize what's wrong. Well, he essentially sings that to the colonies, the character of George III. Um, he'll sing that complete with harpsichord, violin. It's a very nice touch. And he asks the reasonable question. Okay, you're gone. What comes next? You're going to come back. Um, sort of thing. Then we get a, just a beautiful song. Um, don't think we'll have time to play it. Burr and Hamilton, they're just sitting in chairs, singing of their new children. And just as there's a new nation, their children are new and will grow up. Hamil Burr will only have the one daughter, at least legitimately. Hamilton will have eight or nine children, one of whom is going to die in a duel, his oldest here. And then we get a song just to wrap everything up. He becomes a very successful lawyer. He's at the Constitutional Convention. He's the author of the Federalist Paper, as I said. He writes 50 of the 80 papers. We'll see George Washington become president. And then you'll see Hamilton. He's given choice Secretary of State or Treasury. He chooses Treasury. Uh, Thomas Jefferson becomes Secretary of um, State. So let's hear a little bit from King George. And in the um, if you go to see Hamilton, I at first this didn't happen when it was a new show. After it had been around for a very little bit, everybody in the audience knew the lyrics and were laughing before, you know, um, this fellow came out and they would sing along with this and many other a song, at least mouth it. So King George, the breakup song. You say 
The price of my love is not a price that you're willing to pay. You cry in your tea, but you hurl in the sea when you see me go by. Why so sad? Remember we made an arrangement when you went away. Now you're making me mad. Remember, despite our estrangement, I'm your man. You'll be back soon. You'll see. You remember you belong to me. You'll be back. Time will tell. You remember that I served you well. Oceans rise, empires fall. We have seen each other through it all. And when push comes to shove, I will send a fully armed battalion to remind you of my love. Da 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 da. cut that off a little short short well that's the end of the act um and i'll just mention here um uh, there is a book uh that put out hamilton the revolution it's the lyrics of the show with a lot of background a lot of notes and then just beautiful pictures you'll learn how the costumes were put together um etc cetera, etc cetera. so you might want to hunt down if you love the show if you're looking for something for your holiday list hamilton the revolution i can recommend it we get to act two i'm Going through rather quickly here, you meet Washington, Jefferson, Madison, and Burr. George Washington is president. You get partisan politics. Um, yeah, the nation is new. George Washington didn't really want to be president. Cincinnati, he wanted to stay back on the farm. But he comes and he is hoping this new republic, believe it or not, there's not going to be a lot of, he's hoping there won't be a lot of political disagreement. Well, it showed up fairly quickly in his first term, particularly his second and it came to a rather ugly head. He had just died um, in the election of 1800. So, and we'll see that here. Big split between Hamilton and Jefferson, Secretary of State, Treasury um, here. And a lot of this is the history of the United States because Hamilton believed in a strong federal government. Jefferson believed more in um, the government of the states. And of course, that's going to come to the head in the Civil War um, and others. But in that time, there were questions of economic policy. I mean, it's rather amazing anyone would write a, a musical about this. But um, the government, uh, remember, yeah, the American Revolution is pretty amazing. Um, it's essentially a rebellion. Where does the money come from? Well, you know, the Americans don't really have a lot of money. They borrow a lot of money, et cetera. They run up a lot of debt to finance the war. How is it going to get paid off? They had bonds that weren't worth a whole lot, currency that was not worth a whole lot. Hamilton had the notion that the federal government would take up this immense debt of $50 million, uh, which is probably what the debt is since the extra debt since I began this talk um, these days, but would essentially turn it into money and then, um, which is the way currency actually works. And it's what happens, there will be a central bank 
um, here, not the Fed, that's a little different here, but there will be a bank, not state banks, there will be one currency. And he has the idea that the federal government will support um, certain industries, help develop industries, have tariffs, et cetera. There's a lot of economics, doesn't show, show up so much in the um, musical, but it's all very important. But this notion of you know federal debt, the state's taking it over, who would have thought that would be the subject of a musical? And it actually is. And Thomas Jefferson and Hamilton are going to disagree very, very much on it. Hamilton is going to write one of his 300 page pamphlets. They're called pamphlets at that time. Uh, write it very, very quickly. And you'll hear Thomas Jefferson, you haven't really seen him look like this, I think. Um, he is going to be against that. And Hamilton, basically George Washington is saying, what to do? Should we accept Hamilton's plan or not? Hamilton says yes, Jefferson says no. The way it's staged is like a, a rap battle. And a rap battle is you have two singers, one sings, um, the other sings back. And, and on stage, it almost looks like a boxing match with George Washington, president, referee, with his two cabinet secretaries. I don't think it works this way these days. So the cabinet battle, here's uh, Jefferson and Hamilton discussing should the federal government take over state, um, uh, state and federal debt, federal and state debt, I should say. So you get to see um, economic policy in 16 words. And there should have been a slide there. Well, maybe you're spared. Um, what Hamilton will say is if we, oh, there we go. Let's listen to this. Hamilton will say if we assume state debts, so I got a, my slides out of place here. If we assume the debts, the union gets a new line of credit, a financial diuretic. That's 300 pages of Alexander Hamilton's writing distilled to 16 words. So here's the cabinet battle. Ladies and gentlemen, you could have been anywhere in the world tonight, but you're here with us in New York City. Are you ready for a cabinet meeting, huh? The issue on the table. Secretary Hamilton's plan to assume state debt and establish a national bank. Secretary Jefferson, you have the floor, sir. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We fought for these ideals, we shouldn't settle for less. These are wise words, enterprising men quote them. Don't act surprised, you guys, cause I wrote them. Ow, but Hamilton forgets. His plan would have the government assume state debt. Now place your bets as to who that benefits. The very seat of government where Hamilton sits. Not true. Oh, if the shoe fits, wear it. If New York's in debt, why should Virginia bear it? Uh, our debts are paid, I'm afraid. Don't tax the South, because we got it made in the shade. In Virginia, we plant seeds in the ground. We create. You just want to move our money around. This financial plan is an outrageous demand, and it's too many damn pages for any man to understand. Stand with me in the land of the free. Pray to God we never see Hamilton's candidacy. Look, when Britain taxed our tea, we got frisky. Imagine what gonna happen when you try to tax our whiskey. Thank you, Secretary Jefferson. Secretary Hamilton, your response. Thomas, that was a real nice declaration. Welcome to the present, we're running a real nation. Would you like to join us? For staying mellow, doing whatever the hell it is you doing, Monticello. If we assume the debts, the union gets a new line of credit, a financial diuretic, how do you not get it? If we're aggressive and competitive, the union gets a boost, you'd rather give it a sedative? A civics lesson from a slave or hey neighbor, your debts are paid because you don't pay for labor. We plant seeds in the South, we create and keep ranting. No, uh, oops, sorry. We know who's really doing the plan. So anyway, um, if I were teaching or if I were a teacher and I were interested in, you know, economic history, this song has so much in it. Again, it's probably 40, 50 pages of Ron Chernow's book uh, discussing the policy debates over the assumption of debt. So George Washington, well, again, he reluctantly was president. One nice thing about Hamilton is that they pick up from actual letters, writings, um, et cetera. And George Washington, of course, um, wanted to go home and didn't want to be president, wanted to uh, essentially serve for one term. And again, he's an older man at this point. He's in his 60s, um, old for the time, at least. And um, he's convinced to hang in for a second term. James Madison has written him a farewell address. At this point um, in the show, Washington has told Hamilton, I'm not running for president. You need a peaceful transfer power. Two terms is enough. 
here, you, you know, the country is going to need to elect somebody um, and have a new president come in um, here. And, you know, he says to uh, Hamilton, this is uh, as an aside, um, you know, it, write, write a farewell address for me and work with me. Ham, you know, it's Washington's voice, but Hamilton's writing. And you can use Madison's address. I could use that. And of course, Hamilton writes a completely new address. That farewell address becomes very important um, here. It's read on the halls of Congress, uh, in the halls of Congress. Used to be published in Bibles in the 19th century. But here is Ham Washington saying he wants to go back to Mount Vernon. And you hear uh, language from the farewell address um, here. If I say goodbye, the nation learns to move on. It outlives me when I'm gone. But the scripture says, everyone shall sit under their own vine and fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. They'll be safe in the nation we've made. I want to sit under my own vine and fig tree, a moment alone nation we've made one last time one last time well you can see hamilton is not all fast rap music here copy of the farewell address um that would have been printed the way it would have been printed here and here at this point hamilton is not treasury secretary he leaves to become a lawyer in 1795, after a few years here, you'll see a pamphlet. It's called the Reynolds Pamphlet, written by Alexander Hamilton. They had long titles back then. I'll read it. Observations on certain documents contained in a newspaper, The History of the United States, in which, and the subject in which the charge of speculation against Alexander Hamilton, late Secretary of Treasury, is fully refuted, written by himself. So this is Hamilton's document. He had been accused, remember, you know, he's in the thick of things. He's Secretary of Treasury. There's a question, how much is the new government going to pay for these bonds? A lot of money is riding on that. And, you know, Hamilton, in theory, could have made money insider information, a rather bad character involved in speculation, um, says uh, he had been involved. It turned out some of his political enemies, possibly Thomas Jefferson in there, had discovered that um, right around this time, early in the Washington administration, 1792, or, or earlier than that, Hamilton wrote a lot of checks to this man known to be a speculator. While Hamilton comes back when that charge is there, writes 100 pages to say, oh, no, no, I wrote checks to the man, but it was because I was sleeping with his wife. I had an affair. I was being blackmailed. So I wrote $1,000 worth of checks in a year, about a third of my salary. And I used to meet her in my house when my wife was off with her family. And so he seemed to think he got off the hook. Well, he didn't necessarily endear himself with his wife um, at that point. But ultimately, um, they will reconcile here. But she sings a beautiful song. I don't, we don't, I don't have it and we don't have time for it. But it's one of the quiet songs in Hamilton. And we'll see the two coming back. The history is not quite right uh, here when their son is killed in a duel. This is a, really, it's about 1800. Um, the timing is not right in the show. But now you have Hamilton. And again, this is, to my mind, the beauty of Hamilton. You have a man who's lost a child, a couple. And at this point, you think they're estranged, even though they've been back together. But you just, he's begging for forgiveness. He thinks he's guilty for having his son killed. And again, Hamilton, tremendous range of emotion in addition to the musical styles that go with that. So let's hear a little bit of, it's quiet uptown. Hamilton built a house. You can still see it. It's up in Harlem. Yeah, this is, uh, by the way, his son uh, here, who apparently looked very much like his father. And some would say Alexander Hamilton was the best looking of the founding fathers. Ladies, you tell me. So Hamilton, it's quiet uptown. And again, you'll just hear this heart-wrenching music. There are moments that the words don't reach. There is suffering too terrible to name. You hold your child as tight as you can and 
push away the unimaginable The moments when you're in so deep It feels easier to just swim down The Hamiltons move uptown And learn to live with the unimaginable I spend hours in the garden I walk alone to the store And it's quiet uptown I never liked the quiet before I take the children to church on Sunday A sign of the cross at the door And I pray That never used to happen before If you see him in the street Walking by himself Talking to himself Have pity Philip, you would like it uptown It's quiet uptown Working through the unimaginable His hair is gone gray He passes every day They say he walks the length of the city You knock me out I fall apart Can you imagine Look at where we are Look at where we started I know I don't deserve you, Eliza But hear me out, that would be enough If I could speak I'm going to have to stop, but it's great music. As you can see, a good mix there. Well, we do have to get back to history. We do have to get back to the election of 1800. Very, very difficult um, election here. Um, so Hamilton's out of office. He's still very influential in the Federalist Party. George Washington is gone. John Adams, vice president, uh, became president. And Hamilton has a scheme. He doesn't particularly like John Adams. Um, he thinks he's too moderate. He's pushing another candidate. And he essentially sabotages the election here. Um, he wants to nominate another person. Well, what happens in the election of 1800, Adams is eliminated. Remember, people don't vote for the president of the Electoral College. Um, does. And at this time, this is going to change at, um, as, because of the election, you didn't really have a ticket. You would have individuals run for president and whoever became got the most votes would become president. The second would become uh, vice president, etc. And typically, people would be of the same party um, here. But what happened, oddly enough, in this election, um, Aaron Burr and Thomas Jefferson, essentially the arrangement <laughs> didn't quite work. Uh, here, Thomas Jefferson um, and Aaron Burr both get uh, the same number of votes. So that it means it goes to the House um, of Representatives. It's going to change where in the, uh, the 12th Amendment, um, you essentially vote for a ticket. So the question is, who's going to win the presidency? Is it Jefferson, who Hamilton doesn't like, or Burr, who's had a number of run-ins with Hamilton um, over the years? And Hamilton chooses the lesser evil and Jefferson becomes president. Burr, there is no president. Burr becomes his vice president. And Burr, you know, Hamilton, uh, excuse me, Jefferson will get rid of him in 1804. Well, people are wondering who to vote for. And what does um, Hamilton say? Hamilton writes a letter, and these letters are rather public. There's no doubt, but by every virtuous and prudent calculation, Jefferson is to be preferred. He is by far not so dangerous a man, and he has pretensions of character. Not the best endorsement. Uh, for Jefferson. But as to Burr, there's nothing in his favor. His private character is not defended by his most partial friends. He is bankrupt beyond redemption except by the plunder of his country. His public principles have no other spring or aim than his own aggrandizement. Vote for Jefferson. If the duel happens four years later, but there's going to be, there had been problems, there would be problems uh, with um, Hamilton Burr later. We get to 1804 now. Basically, Jefferson is not going to have Burr as vice president. Burr runs to be president of, excuse me, governor of New York State, which is where Hamilton is living. It's where the national capital is. And Burr loses. But shortly after his loss, he's not very happy. He reads in the newspaper something to the effect of, written by a prominent person, oh, I had dinner with Alexander Hamilton, who said, um, it's good that Burr lost. Um, yeah, Burr is a terrible person. 
And Berg said, well, what exactly did Alexander Hamilton say? He went to Hamilton. And Hamilton could have just said, it's fake news. Don't believe what you read in the paper. You know, it wasn't well reported, um, et cetera. Instead, he says something to the effect of, you know, Aaron, I've known you for 20 years plus. There's so many things I could have said. Uh, maybe I should make up a list. And it goes back and forth. And pretty quickly, Aaron Burr says, let's meet for a duel. Um, so the duel is destined to happen uh, with these pistols, which you can still see up in New York City, Chase Manhattan Bank. And what's interesting about the duel, by the time we get to that, you would think it's you know going to be a huge part of the show. It's not. It's very, very quick. And basically the highlight is Aaron Burr, Alexander Hamilton facing each other, and Burr is there, Burr is ready to fire. Hamilton is with his gun, deciding, do I lose my shot, throw it up in the air? But it's also, what am I going to do? Am I going to have, looking back on his life, am I going to have a legacy? Uh, have I done anything in my life? And again, this is the appeal of Hamilton here. Now, what's amazing about this scene, it's only about five minutes when we get to it, four minutes, really. There's virtually no music. You kind of hear the sound of wind here. Um, going by. So here we are on stage, the two, the guns raised to each other. But before we get there, we get a song. It almost seems like a throwaway song. And it's Hamilton. The duel has been set. Hamilton is going to go off to Weehawken, New Jersey, across the river uh, early in the morning. And he tells his wife that he needs to write a letter. It's his farewell to her. And um, he'll be back. Well, it turns out he won't be back. And it's not much of a song, but notice how it ends. It ends with the line, best of wives, best of women. Alexander, come back to sleep. I have an early meeting out of town. It's still dark outside. I know. I just need to write something down. Why do you write like you're running out of time? Come back to bed, that would be enough I'll be back before you know I'm gone Come back to sleep This meeting's at dawn Well, I'm going back to sleep Hey Best of wives and best of women Well, that's a great line. Or it's a sad line. It's the actual line in the letter Hamilton wrote about a week before. But when Ron Chernow wrote his Hamilton book, his wife Valerie died shortly thereafter, and her tombstone has the lines, best of wives, best of women. So now we get the duel. It's Hamilton looking back on his life. It's You'll get narrative, everything that goes into the duel. Then you'll hear Hamilton. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There are 10 things you need to know. Number one. We rode across the Hudson and dawn. My friend William P. Van Ness signed on as my number, number two. two. Hamilton arrived with his crew, Nathaniel Pendleton and the doctor that he knew. Number three. I watched Hamilton examine the terrain. I wish I could tell you what was happening in his brain. This man is poisoned by political pursuits. Most disputes die and no one shoots. Number four. Hamilton drew first position, looking to the world like a man on a mission. This is a soldier with a marksman's ability. The doctor turned around so he could have deniability. Five. Now I didn't know this at the time, but we were near the same spot. My son died, is that why? He examined his gun with such rigor. I watched as he methodically fiddled with the trigger. Seven. Confession time, here's what I got. My fellow soldiers will tell you I'm a terrible shot. Number eight. Your last chance to negotiate. Send in your second, see if they can set the record straight. They won't teach you this in your classes, but look it up. Hamilton was wearing his glasses. Why? If not to take deadly aim, it's him or me. The world will never be the same. I had only one thought before the slaughter. This man will not make an orphan of my daughter. Number nine. Look him in the eye, aim no higher. Summon all the courage you require, then count. One, two, three. I imagine death so much it feels more like a memory. Is this where it gets me? On my feet, several feet ahead of me. I see it coming. Do I run or fire my gun or let it be? There is no beat, no melody. 
Burr, my first friend, my enemy, maybe the last face I ever see. If I throw away my shot, is this how you remember me? What if this bullet is my legacy? Legacy? What is a legacy? It's planting seeds in a garden you never get to see. I wrote some notes at the beginning of a song someone will sing for me. America, you great unfinished symphony, you sent for me. You let me make a difference. A place where even orphan immigrants can leave their fingerprints and rise up. I'm running out of time, I'm running in my time's up. Wise up, eyes up. I catch a glimpse of the other side. Lawrence leads a soldier's chorus on the other side. My son is on the other side. He's with my mother on the other side. Washington is watching from the other side. Teach me how to say goodbye. Rise up, rise up, rise up, Eliza. My love, take your time. I'll see you on the other side. Raise a glass to freedom. He aims his pistol at the skyway! I strike him right between his ribs. I walk towards him, but I am ushered away. They row him back across the Hudson. Tells me you'd better hide. They say Angelica and Eliza were both at his side when he died. Death doesn't discriminate between the sinners and the saints. It takes and it takes and it takes. History obliterates in every picture it paints. It paints me in all my mistakes. When Alexander reigned at the sky, he may have been the first one to die, but I'm the one who paid for it. I survived, but I paid for it. I'm going to cut that song just a little bit short. Well, now we get to the finale of Hamilton. You know, we're at the end of a long show, and I'm rushing time. I might go a few minutes over here. But... You get a song, it could have been like a big, glorious song, you know, bugles, trumpets, um, drums. You know, Hamilton founded the United States. We're going to go on to great things. But it's actually very, very quiet. It's very much like the opening. Everybody who knew Hamilton comes out on stage and they reflect on his life. And the last words of the song are, um, who lives, who dies, who tells your story? Will they tell your story? And that, again, what Hamilton is about. Let me tell you what I wish I'd known When I was young and dreamed of glory You have no control Who lives, who dies, who tells your story President Jefferson, I give him this His financial system is a work of genius I couldn't undo it if I tried And I tried Who lives, who dies, who tells your story President Madison, he took our country from bankruptcy to prosperity I hate to admit it, but he doesn't get enough credit for all the credit he gave us. Who lives, who dies, who tells your story? Every other founding father's story gets told. Every other founding father gets to grow old. And when you're gone, who remembers your name? Who keeps your flame? Who, who tells, tells your story? Who tells your story? Who tells your story? Myself back in the narrative. Please stop wasting time on tears. I live another 50 years. It's not enough. I interview every soldier who fought by your side. I try to make sense of your thousands of pages of writings. You really do write, but you're running out of time. I rely on Angelica. While she's alive, we tell your story. Church near you when I needed her most, she was right on time. And I'm still not through. I ask myself, what would you do if you had more time? The Lord, in His kindness, He gives me what you always want, and He gives me more time. I raise funds in DC for the Washington Monument. He 
what I'm proudest of. Be your orphan I established the first private orphanage in New York City. Be your orphan I helped raise hundreds of children. I get to see them growing Be up. In their eyes, I see you, Alexander. I see you every time. And when my time is up, have I done enough? Will they tell the story? Oh, I can't wait to see you again. It's only a matter of time. Beautiful ending to the show. Historical aftermath, what happened? Aaron Burr, he's disgraced. He dies 30 years later, poverty. Uh, wife Eliza lives well into her 90s, into the 1850s, something of a relic. People would say, what was it like to dance with Ben Franklin 70 years ago? Orphanage is still with us. Hamilton, you know, he had a set of policies, by and large. Uh, they went into place. Uh, they stood. Hamilton, it's America's, um, it's Hamilton's American way. Very influential. Uh, here. There was talk of taking him off the $10 bill. Didn't make a whole lot of sense, but thanks to a certain musical in 2017, there was an outrage. People said, keep Hamilton on the currency here. I want to sum up the show and just give you a little clip. I know we're pushing time here. What I love about Hamilton, what other people did, it humanizes Hamilton. You know, oftentimes you think of the historical figures, the founders, as being typically men in togas. That's how they're portrayed in marble statues. But these are real people with strengths and weaknesses. Some of them lied and cheated. Some of them did not. Um, but they're real people you can identify with. I think the history is interesting, relevant. People are interested. They're reading these big books here. And I think it challenges people to have a legacy and also to tell their story, to have something to tell um, here, to make good. And I think that takes it much more than theatrical entertainment. People get interested in history, get in, um, you know, compared to Le Mis, nobody even knows what revolution it is. Hamilton, people are learning about the Revolutionary War or, you know, their family background um, here. A little more on Hamilton. It certainly got people interested in theater, uh, people of all ages. And Hamilton, you know, people say it's revolutionary and that it's using contemporary music and speech. Um, isn't that new? It, the answer is not really. Irving Berlin brought the speech and music of Eastern Europe into musicals like 1910, 1920. Gershwin brought in African-American, uh, as, as did Harold Orlin, um, in the form of jazz, Af African-American music here. So the fun thing is it's worth seeing. I know we're almost at time, but I want to give you one more little clip I think it's worth hanging in for. Um, here's a little girl. It turns out this was made in 2020 in the beginning of COVID. And she had planned, she was, turn, I think, turning nine years old. She was going to go see Hamilton um, up in New York, but it couldn't happen. Um, but it turned out somebody heard about this. Remember Emily Blunt, who played Mary Poppins with Lynn manuel uh, Manuel Miranda in um, Mary Poppins Returns. Her husband, John Krasinski from The Office, had kind of an internet show. He would do interviews with people during the pandemic to say what's new, what's the good news out there. And he heard about this girl and he made arrangements when the pandemic was over in a month or two. That's what people thought. She would be able to go up to New York uh, to see it as the guest of uh, him and his wife. And she gets quite a surprise here. That's a good cheer up movie. I love hearing that. Since Lemon Well Miranda kind of was in it on one Broadway, it was kind of the same. He is in it. Um, I mean, he's not like the best part of it, obviously. Clearly, I'm the best part of it. Yeah, Lynn is not a good part in the movie. He yeah. is a okay part. He's kind of like a backup dancer. He's kind of like a backup dancer, I would yeah, say. He's yeah, he's kind of like a like a b-boy. I mean, I forget that he's even in there. Hello? Oh, wow. Hang on a second. I was wow. in the Poppins. Women Miranda? He just joined. Oh, oh wait. 
Hi. Hey, Lynn, I didn't know you could Zoom bomb, man. That's, uh, that's yeah, a little Lynn, weird. This is a Zoom bomb. She's here to see Mary Poppins, not Jack the Lamplighter. Yeah, okay? exactly. Hi, Aubrey. How are you? Uh, I'm Good. so sorry you didn't get to see Hamilton. I'm so glad to meet you. <laughs> oh, my God. Hi. Oh, um, man, Lynn, thank you so much for stopping by, but uh, we, we pretty much got it handled now. We, thanks, I just, Lynn, we're good. We did a really classy thing. We sent her tickets. Oh, are you a big center. office man? Nope. She's no, not I'm, really man at all. I'm a big fan of the memes of it, though. Oh, nice. <laughs> thanks for bringing that up, Lynn. That was a sore like subject. The, <laughs> but we, um, we're sending her to New York, Lynn, and we're going to send her to Hamilton in New York. Well, that's amazing. Um, I, I think we can top that right now, though. Oh, wait. Something oh, wait, oh, wait. Sorry. There are a bunch of people wow. just joining. That's my favorite song from Hamilton. How does a bastard? Plus, this is the original cast of Hamilton. The little girl is singing all at home, you know, during the pandemic. Orphan, son of a whore and a Scotsman, dropped in the middle of a forgotten spot in the Caribbean by providence impoverished and squalor, grow up to be a hero and a scholar. The ten dollar, founded father without a father, got a lot farther by working a lot, harder by being a lot smarter by being the self starter by 14. They placed him in charge of a trading charter. And every day while slaves were being slaughtered and carted away, across the waves he struggled and kept his guard up. Inside he was longing for something to be a part of. The brother was ready to beg, steal, borrow, or barter. Then a hurricane came and devastation reigned. Our man saw his future drip dripping down the drain. Put a pencil to his temple, connected it to his brain. And he wrote his first refrain, a testament to his pain. A little word got around and said, this kid is insane, man. Took up a collection just to send him to the mainland. Get your education, don't forget from whence you came. And the world's gonna know your name, what's your name? Alexander Hamilton My name is Alexander Hamilton And there's a million things I haven't done But just you wait, just you wait When he was ten his father split full of it Dead ridden two years later See Alex and his mother bedridden half dead Sitting in their own sick percent thick And Alex got better, better by his, his mother, mother went quick Moved in with the cousin, the cousin committed suicide Left him with nothing but ruined pride Something new inside a voice saying Alex, you gotta fend for yourself Started retreating and reading every treatise on the shelf There would have been nothing left to do for someone less astute He would have been dead and destitute without a cent of restitution Started working, clerking for his late mother's landlord Trading sugar cane and rum and all the things he can't afford Can it Every book he could get his hands on Living yeah. for the future, see him now As he stands on the bow of the ship Heading for a new land In New York, you can be a new man In New York, you can be a new man In New York, you can be a new man In New York, you can be a new man In New York, New York Just you With him. Me, I died for him. Me, I trusted him. Me, I loved him. And me, I'm the damn fool that shot him. There's a million things I haven't done, but just you the way. What's your name? If you can't go to Hamilton, we're bringing Hamilton to you. Hey. That's it. Oh.
Now, I don't know if she actually made it to New York. 12, 13 million people saw that early days of the pandemic. So I leave you with the message of Hamilton, the last lines, and I think part of its appeal, who lives, who dies, who tells your story, or they tell your story. So I'll stop with that. Um, I know we went over a little bit or we're at time. So I don't know if you want to have, do we have questions? So I've got a few people liking the show. Thank you very much. Um, the arts help people with the pandemic. There would have been more suicides without them. Few people liking um, this, all well and good. Um, moderators, do you see any questions? Somebody's going to see the show in Boise, Idaho. I remind you, you can still see it on Disney. And instead of paying $699, which many people did, you can see it for six or $7 on well, um, a week on Disney. People enjoyed. Um, thanks to AARP. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Dan, I, Dan, I saw one question about, do you have any additional recommended readings related to this time in history? This time of history, I always think one of the best ways to learn anything is to learn biography. You know, you want to learn about science, but you don't like the formulas of general relativity. Read uh, Walter Isaacson's book on um, Einstein. For this, I would read Ron Chernow's book. And if you don't want to invest in that, you know, Hamilton's a fascinating story. The George Washington book is very, very good, um, too, because, you know, Washington is such an important character, you know, pre-revolution, revolution, revolution uh, the presidency, et cetera. So I would look at uh, that. Somebody liked the closing of the presentation. I like that. The historical inaccuracies, as many are uh, they're in here. I mean, the inaccuracies here tend to be people who won in the same time and place are together. Um, they're not too, too serious. Um, I don't think they changed the fundamental argument uh, here. Remember, Ron Chernow is very much involved um, in writing the book um, of Hamilton or, you know, getting the script together. So the inaccuracies, you know, they add to drama. Uh, they don't bother me all that much. Sure, you can make it 100%. You could have fun trying to pick things out. And, you know, this will happen. It would be like a novel where things are compressed in time, uh, dialogue is made up, um, you know, um, et cetera. So yeah. um, what can we say about the interviews mentioned by Eliza's character? You'd have to go to a Hamilton biography. Her son wrote like a five volume biography of um, Hamilton. So that's the way John Marshall wrote a similar one on George Washington. So yeah, I think that's about all we've got time for, Dan. So I will say thank you to you for this presentation. Thank you to LLI Nova for sharing this with our AAR members. Thank and you Patty or Debbie, do you have anything you'd like to add? I just want to thank everybody for coming to this wonderful presentation that Dan did. And remember, he's doing one for us in AARP in two weeks on October 29th on Hitchcock. Just in time for Halloween. Yep. <laughs> and you can register for that one at aarp.org slash V as in Victor CC, Virtual Community Center. And of course, LLI members can register on the website in classes. Perfect. Thank right, you, well, everyone. I hope everyone enjoyed. It's a great, great musical with great history. Bye-bye.